Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I'm your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with Ronald Shellikins. Ronald is the Executive Vice President and CHRO of PepsiCo, a company with more than 260,000 employees with products that include Frito-Lay, Gatorade, Pepsi-Cola, Quaker, Tropicana, and at least 17 additional products with over $1 billion per year in annual sales across more than 200 countries worldwide. Thank you very much for coming down to South Carolina. We sincerely appreciate having you here on campus. You're welcome. So being, a, being the CHRO of Pepsi, that's a new role for you, but being in charge of, of HR is certainly not. Can you share with us a little bit about what, how you think of your priorities when you first start in a role like this? Yeah, listen, I, I think ultimately you start with uh, what the business wants. Yeah? So um, if you look at, um, uh, I had the, the, the fortunate position to start pretty shortly after Ramon Laguarta was appointed new CEO of the company. So he's thinking about what do you want to do with the company. And if you look at the strategy he's laid out, is, is basically to uh, move the company from, a, let's say, a 3.5% top-line company to a 4.5%, 5% top-line uh, company. And, um, uh, and, and he talks about by uh, unleashing the potential of the company. So we don't have a consumption problem. People like our products, both in the food side as well as the drinks. Uh, but how can you capture that, uh, that opportunity? So you, I think you start with, uh, with that. Yeah? And um, uh, if you then uh, think through what are, I think, the levers we pull, uh, first and foremost for me, it's a talent lever. Yeah? So what can we do to build that talent which helps to grow uh, the company at a rate of 4.5%? Uh, yeah? So where, uh, what type of talent do we need uh, in what pockets? Now, for example, uh, a big chunk of that growth will come from uh, international, uh, will come from new markets. So how do we uh, find talent in these markets? Another vector we have is, uh, is uh, e-commerce, uh, digital, uh, internet-based uh, uh, selling. So how do we get pockets of talent who, which understand uh, e-commerce? So, so I'd say the first uh, lever was, uh, was uh, the talent lever. Uh, the second, and they're a little bit associated, is, is, is capability. So we're really uh, looking at what new, what new capabilities do we need. Uh, and that is in supply chain. It's, it's fundamentally uh, changing. Uh, retail is changing. We have to adopt to that reality. Um, so new uh, capabilities in supply chain. I mentioned e-commerce is another capability we're building. So we're very much uh, uh, focusing on... on uh, how do you strengthen these uh, and build these new capabilities? Um, the third vector for me is always organization and organization effectiveness. And how do you operate uh, in a model we have where we, we want it all? We want to have a strong local company managed by strong local teams with P&L accountability. Uh, and we want to have the benefit of scale of a large corporation. And, and there's intrinsically, obviously, uh, tension in these two, uh, in these two things. And, and how do you build an organizational model which allows for that? But also, how do you build a culture and capabilities to, deals, to deal with that tension? Yeah? And, and uh, so that's the, the, the third uh, vector. And, and then the final vector is, is, is very much around culture. Uh, so um, what, what type of culture, leadership behavior, do we want to build? And we've launched uh, recently uh, a big culture change program called uh, the PepsiCo Way, uh, where we have defined seven behavioral attributes we believe will help us to build this growth company. Uh, and we're rolling that out as we, as we speak to, uh, to make sure people understand that culture, but also that we can activate it in, uh, in behavior and, and, and our HR uh, tools and, uh, and processes. And then, and then there's always for me, these are the four vectors. And then I have the plus one, uh, which is the fifth one, which we run our own HR shop as well. Yeah? And, and our HR shop needs to be, uh, I think, doing two things. One, uh, deliver a great employee experience. The people say, wow, it's the interface with HR is, uh, is, is smooth, it's efficient, and, and it's intuitive. Uh, and it's digital, uh, more and more of uh, our interface is, uh, is digitally enabled. Plus HR operations, uh, our back office is an, is an productivity 
opportunity for us as well. So, so we, we, we can do it better, smarter, offshore. So I, I, we run an HR shop as well. So four plus one priorities uh, I'm, uh, I'm focusing on with my team. Yeah? So I'd like to pull each of those apart just a little bit. Yeah. So you started with talent. And uh, so first, thank you, you your company's hired more of our Masters of Human Resource students than any other company over the last five yeah. years. So we're so happy, thank we're happy. You. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, can you say a little bit about, I mean, HR has changed so dramatically over the course of your career. Can you, can you say a little bit about what, what are the skills that you're looking for now um, uh, as people begin their HR profession? Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, a lot has changed, but also a lot is, is, uh, is the same. Yeah, I mean, um, a, a couple of uh, things r recently, I think, which are really uh, playing in our profession. And I would say digitalization is the biggest one. Uh, because that's happening across all the functions, across all companies, but it's also happening in our own profession. Uh, and, and really understanding what are the implications of that throughout the company and how do you play into that as HR, uh, I think is super important. A practical example, uh, if you look at uh, most of our, uh, our warehouses, our factories, automation is continuously evolving and that has an impact on the people we have in the company, both the quantity of people we have but also the type of roles we have. Now how do we play into that? that that's not so daunting and that we can help our employees to transition to different roles uh, and that we do these migrations in a way that it's, it's a, a positive experience rather than that it's daunting and, and negative. But it's, it's also in HR. I mean, uh, I mentioned to you earlier, I, I really am pushing uh, the company to say, okay, how do we make uh, the interface with HR, specifically, let's say the back office of HR, as digital as possible. So I continuously talk about it should be digital, it should be mobile enabled, because people don't want to come to an office necessarily, so it needs to be mobile enabled. It needs to be simple and it needs to be intuitive. These are the four words I continuously uh, use around, uh, uh, around the interface we need to, uh, to build. And is, is that what you mean by the employee experience? Or yeah, or more yeah. Uh, and and um, these four, these four, I think, words are, are playing into this. I think there's a second, uh, a second element, which is the employee experience is not only the exclusive domain of HR. Yeah, so the reality is that many functions impact the employee experience. It's finance, it's procurement, it's office management. And what we've been doing is really broaden the responsibility in HR to say we need to own that employee experience and we need to build something which is uh, great but great cross-functional. Uh, the problem is in the past everybody optimized that interface with employees so HR did their best, finance did their best but it never really translated itself into a, into a great experience. So most of the companies where you go to they go to a portal and then you have to find somewhere in the HR section an HR process. You need to go to IT to find an IT, IT, IT section. That's not how employee want to be served. They want to simply say, tell me what, what I need to do. And it has to come together in a very simple and intuitive way. If I want to order a PC, I don't want to think it's IT. I want to simply order a PC. I don't care what function actually delivers that. And that, I think, digital delivers that opportunity to create a cross-functional experience. And, and you talked about supply chain. And yeah. for people not familiar with kind of modern HR, can you say a little bit about like, how does HR, how is that part of your domain? Why is that something that you think of from an HR perspective? Yeah, it's, it's simply one of, the, one of the business functions we have in our company. But in, in our case, if you look at uh, supply chain, it, it's everything from, uh, let's say, the factories, the long haul transportation to our warehousing infrastructure, and then the delivery from our warehouses to, uh, to the end position in the, in the store. Uh, we are the largest private fleet in the U.S. Uh, and we have 200,000 people working on the front line. So it's, a, it's an enormous uh, um, orchestration to, um, to bring our products to, uh, to um, uh, consumers on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's very employee-centric. You know, it's, it's not the trucks, it's not the, the hardware. It's really our, our employees who deliver magic on a day-to-day -day basis. And great people in factories who are highly motivated and who have passion for the company uh, deliver, deliver magic for us. And, and, and uh, that's where we play in, to, to, to say, okay, 
what people do we hire, how do we reward them, uh, how do we motivate them, how do we instill core d'esprit, I think that's, that's HR domain. Not exclusively, but obviously we, we need to orchestrate that, uh, that well enough. And uh, uh, one, one simple example, last night we had what we call our uh, circle of champions, where we have our uh, annual recognition event for 200 people of the frontline supply chain organization who come with their, their uh, spouses and family uh, members or friends and we honor them and recognize them. And these are amazing uh, moments because many of them uh, have never been abroad or have never been to, to uh, our headquarter and, and, and we, we, we spend a lot of time on this recognizing frontline and, and having passion. These are the people who really make PepsiCo. It's not obviously the senior executives as well, but the front line delivers an, the, the experience to our, uh, to our consumers and our customers. I like the, I, the, the thought of delivering magic or making magic for them. Yeah. That's great. So an, another part that you talked about was the organizational structure. I, again, yeah. that doesn't, I think to a lot of people, that wouldn't sound like something that the CHRO would come in and say, yes, that's a, that's a part that I really have to be involved in and engaged in and to, to try to help create uh, this competitive advantage in the marketplace. Yeah, I, I think it's our, it's our job. Yeah? I think the, the, how the large, uh, large companies designed and orchestrated, someone needs to take accountability for that. And I think it's our expertise. And I think we, we as HR should have the expertise, not only around structures and boxes and lines, but also decision rights, how the money flows, how decisions are being made. I think a more comprehensive look on how organizations work. And, and I think that's our role to orchestrate that. Um, and um, as I said to you before, I mean, we, we have this beautiful model where we want to have it both. You know, strong local companies uh, with P&L accountability and the benefit of, uh, of scale. And that, that there is tension in that uh, uh, model. And I would say the worst you can do is try to get rid of the tension uh, because you can simply get rid of it by completely localizing your business, but then you don't have the benefit of scale. Or you can say, I'm going to functionalize completely, but then you lose all your senior managers in, in, in the market. So, so it's designed for, uh, for a certain form of tension. And I think our role is to take as, as much tension out as we can, but also build capabilities with people who work in that to deal with that and to see it as a positive and constructive uh, tension. Um, a practical example in our field, uh, uh, we, we recruit uh, graduates. Uh, we, we hire 1,800 graduates uh, uh, per year, year on year, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process we have uh, really honed well. Sometimes you have businesses who are, have P&L pressures, and they say, ah, do I need these graduates? Yeah? And, and, and they will look at it on a year basis, and they say, no, I, I can't afford it in my P&L. But we know if we don't stay in the graduate game year on year on year, you lose traction, you don't get the top of the, of the house. So there's intrinsic tension and there's nothing wrong. Rightfully so, the person says, IP and L pressures. Rightfully so, the corporation says, we need to stay in the game. So how do you solve that? That is, that is really, uh, I think, where organization design and also behavior kicks in. Yeah? So it's really an interesting uh, a thought that that companies need or, or should be maybe embracing some of that tension, which seems like a skill set that we, I mean, we don't really talk to our students very much about, about kind of having that. I th maybe we talk about it in terms of agility, but I've not really thought about it in terms of embracing the inherent tension that's out in the world. Yeah, it, but I, I, think, I think there's sometimes a little bit of naivety, both in organizations as well as in the outside world, that the design is, is set up to deliver that tension. Uh, and, and because you want to have it both. Yeah? And if you want to have it both, there is tension in that, uh, in that model. And, and once again, I think c clearly there, there are little tensions we can remove around sometimes unclarity, around decision making, rights, uh, budgets. So we try to keep it as, as clean and simple as possible. But it's, the tension is there. And the rest needs to be resolved by um, managerial skills. Now, one of the, the ways we are trying to solve that as well is move people around the businesses and headquarter versus uh, local businesses. The issue is, if, if you've always worked in a market, yeah, you always believe that everything which comes from headquarters is, is what do these people do? Yeah? Uh, and 
when you move someone to headquarters, you suddenly realize, hey, these are good people. They're doing meaningful jobs. And I understand their perspective now. You need to move people around as a way to deal with that tension. Understand what other people do in the company and, and, and therefore create appreciation uh, that everybody is doing a meaningful job. You know? That sounds like a, a brilliant way to take something that normally we would hear tension as a, as a negative and turn it into a, a positive way for competing in the marketplace. So the, the other, and maybe this is related to it, but the, the last one you talked about was culture. Mm -hmm. And it seems like companies are spending a little more time these days on thinking about com culture, including boards of directors. And yeah. in addition to embracing that tension as part of the, the culture, is there is there something else that you think of that HR should be doing to drive that, to drive a culture that leads towards winning in the marketplace? Uh, I think it, it's a big, a big accountability item in my opinion for HR, and it start with, um, it start with making a decision: is your culture one culture, or is your culture multiple cultures? And, and you have a choice point there. I wouldn't say that one is right or wrong, but. Uh, take the PepsiCo away. We, we had a tradition that local market units uh, built their own culture. So you came in as a CEO and you launch your own culture program. Uh, now the, the problem, back to uh, the organization model, is that y you're not working exclusively in a market anymore with all the people around you being part of the market unit. So you have people who are working in vertical organizations who sit embedded in your country but they don't necessarily work for you directly as a market unit. If everybody starts building their culture, it becomes obviously very confusing. So we really decided to move from this local uh, culture model to one culture model for, uh, for uh, PepsiCo. And we've articulated uh, seven uh, attributes, which we believe are, are winning to deliver up upon high growth. Uh, but it's quite tough because then you have to say to uh, the market unit managers and the business unit managers, you're not allowed anymore to make your local culture descriptor. Yeah? You have to, we only will have one culture. And that's kind of a big uh, breakage with tradition and how we uh, ran the company in the past. Um, now we, we, we did that, we went through that to say, no, we have one, we have one culture. But I think we were smart enough to say, okay, but how you activate that in your local market, we will not prescribe that. But the words are the same. So we have, for example, uh, consumer-centric is one of the cultural attributes. It has to be consumer-centric, it can't be something else. But how you activate consumer-centric in the context of India, Germany, US, might be completely different. So we allowed a lot of freedom to activate that uh, in, uh, in the local market. So I call it freedom within a framework, the framework the corporation sets, the activation is local. And I think that played well in our uh, company. So the activation has been amazing. Uh, in, in We've done that in the last seven months. The, the activation has been amazing. And I think the key was that uh, we were clear, no exceptions, but you figure out how you do it in your local context. And I think that there was magic in that. Because uh, uh, it plays to the heart of a central, decentral company. Yeah? So you came in from the outside, although you had been at Pepsi at another time in your career. Yeah. W can you say a little bit about, was it helpful to, having, to have been there in the past and come back? So it's, it's more of a broader question about your thoughts on what are often referred to as boomerang employees, right? yeah. those that have come back to an organization they left in the past. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, a, I'm a boomerang. I, I left uh, PepsiCo 15 years ago, having worked for PepsiCo nine years, uh, but pro predominantly in the in the Europe, Middle East, Africa region, and predominantly in the food side of the business rather than the beverage business. I think it's a little bit, uh, on balance, I think it helped rather than that it didn't help. But I think there are some watch outs uh, where you have to be um, quite um, um, conscious about. Um, a, the company is not the same versus when you left. Uh, and that's not only about the products they hold, we have many more products, we are in many more markets, but also the way of operating is a little bit different perhaps than uh, uh, you can remember. So uh, you have to be, I think, a little bit cautious. I, I was quite um, conscious as well that I had never worked in the US. Uh, so although I worked for American companies, I'd never physically lived and worked in the US. And we have an enormous business in the US for us. Yeah? So. Uh, I, I treated really the, the getting to know the U.S. 
as a, it's a new company for me. I really have to understand how it works, the culture, the ways of working. Uh, whilst international, I felt a little bit more at ease, uh, also because of the other jobs I'd done. And uh, I think that's how I, uh, how I uh, treated that. Now, I, I said in the beginning, listen, I'm going to treat this f fully as a new experience, but your muscle memory of how it works in a company kicks in pretty quickly, actually. So after a couple of months, I left that a little bit behind me and, and, and start doing stuff, making decisions, some of it perhaps a little bit too early, uh, but, but at a certain moment you, you feel, okay, I, I, I feel comfortable. Yeah. But in the U.S. still, I'm learning. I'm learning a lot about labor relations, uh, union, union contracts, um, uh, a little bit culturally as well. It's, not, it's sometimes very misleading because you speak English, you think, okay, we understand each other. But there are, there are cultural layers uh, you have to really unpack and be a little humble about, I think. And so, and, and with thinking about as you joined, as you came back to PepsiCo, when you, and you came in as an outsider then, kind of, uh, to join that executive leadership team, are there things that you need to keep in mind when you're joining that team or, uh, that are different or uh, unique about, about helping trying to lead a, a, a large organization? Yeah, listen, I think any company you come in, I think you, you need to take a, a little bit of a humble position and, and learn uh, and, and be open and, and not, not, not try to impose too much. Um, I think you always have the, the, the dilemma when you come to a, a company. I mean, I worked for Vodafone before 10 years as a CHRO. Uh, so you use Vodafone sometimes as a reference point in your discussion in, in, uh, in PepsiCo. That starts irritating people pretty quickly. Yeah, so, so because the last thing they want is that, that they that, that I come into Vodafone nice uh, PepsiCo. So you, so you need to. I don't talk about Vodafone anymore. I would say in my in some of my previous experiences to to make sure that that you're that you're not irritating people unnecessarily. I think these are some of the watch outs you have to uh, you have to um, you you learn quickly to be smart about that and and not irritate people. And I think you have to really. Uh, resist, uh, which is not easy, but resist what works in one company does not necessarily translate into another company. So e e HR is not universal. Uh, the, 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 the businesses are very different and you need to come up with, I think, the HR interventions which are suitable for that business and the strategy they are working on. And I think that art uh, to, to figure out, okay, what is that business, what does this business need? And what does this business need now because of the strategic direction? I think is super important. And you can't copy paste HR from one company to another. And is that true then also when you're just thinking about how the executive leadership team works together as a team? That each, each ELT will actually be different across companies and you need to be thinking about how to make this one most efficient? Yeah, but this is always one of the, the, the tricky pieces. Uh, if you have a large company li like ourselves, so we operate in most, most of the markets, in most of the countries in the world, and we have 280,000 uh, associates. Yeah? Um, what, what is owned by the corporation? What is standard? What is central? And people have no rights locally to, um, to change. And what is local? And that's, that's a, a kind of an interesting art form. You have to, to um, have a cer certain view yourself, but also you need to obviously align your executive committee uh, colleagues on that. But l let's take an example. <coughs> we were quite decentralized in our approach to, uh, to talent management. So our food business in the US, Frito-Lay, uh, has a, a fantastic pipeline of talent, really amazing, but they are amazing for Frito-Lay North America. Yeah? So we've built a, an amazing pipeline for Frito-Lay North America. The same we've done in, 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 in international, in, let's say in Europe, for example, perhaps to a little bit less extent. Um, the problem with that is that you always fall short and you, you're not building enough leaders who can actually l have an enterprise perspective. So what we've done is the ownership of the top 200 of the company is, is not a division ownership anymore. It's owned by the executive committee. So we arbitrate talent moves and the top of the house 
at an executive committee level, like you do capital, to say where, where do we put our best talent against our biggest challenges. And, and that's a collective uh, decision. The same applies to the people who, have the p who we believe have the potential to get to the top 200 of the company. That talent needs to, the moves need to be arbitrated, what's right for PepsiCo and not what's right for the foods business or what's right for the beverage business. And th that is a little bit of a cultural shift. Now many markets, many companies do that already, but in our case we were more decentralized. And that's a big shift we are, uh, we are making. Now that's an example of what, what is owned by the corporation versus what is owned by, uh, by uh, division. When it comes to, um, let's take the other side, when it comes to labor relations, I think we have a philosophical position around labor relations, but the execution of that is very local. It's not even necessarily at country level, it's very at site level in the way, uh, in the way we uh, in, uh, do labor. Yeah? Philos philosophy clear, uh, but, but the execution of that I is a local execution. Yeah? So the, the data is pretty clear that most CEOs come from inside the organization, something like close to 70%. Yeah. But for CHROs, it's almost opposite that, only about 30%. Since the business of HR is developing talent, and we have a lot of reasons why we think CEOs and often CFOs the same, should come from inside, what's going on with HR? Why, why are we lagging in this area, if we are? I, I believe uh, strong companies tend to promote from within. I mean, forget HR for one second, but I think strong companies promote from within. We have a little bit of a philosophy where we say we try to be somewhere 70, 75% is promotion from within, but we also have to hire from the external world because we need to infuse new ideas, new thinking. So it can't be completely promotion from within. Um, the reality is that some roles are more transferable than others. So if you look at our company, uh, where our promotion from within philosophy is strongest it's really in areas like supply chain, uh, because really we have a very unique uh, direct store delivery system where there are not that many companies we, where we can, can uh, recruit from. Um, we're quite strong in promotion from within in the commercial side, marketing, really str building strategic capabilities. Some prof professions are more transferable, finance, legal, uh, HR. And therefore, I think uh, people sometimes see uh, the, the opportunity of uh, um, hiring from outside. In my heart, uh, uh, it's always a question um, what the CEO wants. Yeah? I is HR, were they happy with HR, therefore they want to see continuation or they want to see a departure and do different things. Yeah? Um, and, and that, that there, there, there are pluses and minuses in there. Yeah? Uh, I, I'm, I'm on balance, it uh, sounds a little bit strange for someone who's been recruited from the outside world. I would prefer to promote from within and seek continuity on HR than that I would bring in external people as a departure uh, from HR. Because I think ultimately the way you treat people, the way you build your people system should be actually more enduring beyond the, m the change of a CO or be beyond the change of a CHRO. Uh, and therefore, I think it, it's more logical to try to promote from uh, within. So I haven't really... Sounds hypocritical. No, 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 <laughs> it, has to ha it has to happen sometimes, yeah. no matter what. Um, I, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I think in, in being rehired, I'm, I'm a hybrid. Yes, that's right. Uh, that's right. That's right. I was just wondering, is there something about... I, I, I really don't know this, I'm, so truly just asking. Is there something about a CEO wanting to make sure that they have someone that's loyal isn't quite the word I'm looking for, but clearly your relationship with the CEO is, is extremely important to the functioning of the CEO. Um, yeah. So is, it the, is there something to the CEO just wanting to make sure they have their own person that is maybe more loyal to the CEO or at least has that perception as opposed to across the whole perhaps others in the organization? I'm not so sure if it's loyalty as it is. Um, um, it's a CEO is a, is a, is a very uh, lonely job, in my opinion, uh, because there's very few people you can talk to. Um, and, and everybody has their own securities and insecurities and question marks. 
And I think good CHROs forge a relationship with the CEO that they can talk uh, about themselves and, and about their team and about the board relationship. Yeah, um, And therefore, to find someone you feel already comfortable with at the start of your uh, tenure uh, is, 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 I think, human, is human, is logical. Yeah, um, and, and I think many CEOs will look through that lens in the choice of uh, CHROs, N not only okay, can they do the organization staff or executive reward, but, but okay, what type of partner will they be whilst I'm in this role? And will I get honest feedback, what's happening in the company? Will I be informed what other people think? Can, I, can that be a positive sparing partner uh, for me in my team with the board? And I think that's sometimes uh, what, what they're, they're looking for. Yeah? So it really is different than perhaps a CFO, where maybe the specific skills from the finance are, uh, are maybe the most important driving force. But for the CHRO, I think what I'm hearing is that there has to be a, 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 a it's much more important for there to be that kind of uh, connection, that um, emotional or... Yeah. or no, I, I mean, it, it, it's uh, completely different, I think. Uh, although, I mean, we have an amazing uh, CFO. Yeah, I didn't mean to disparage all CFOs in the world. Or no, no, no. But, 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 but it uh, sounds like there needs to, there, in the CHRO role, because a big chunk of that is the role of confidant, that there needs to be a, a, an even stronger personal connection. Okay, so. Yeah, I think if, if I look at CFO, well, it's a little bit dangerous uh, territory for me. But uh, I mean, if you're, I think ma many CEOs look at, okay, I want to make sure that the business decisions I make, I have a sparing partner in the CFO who creates a, a challenge board for me, that, 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 that it cr which creates confidence that the business decisions I make are really also delivering the financial results we need. And then obviously, good financial housekeeping and, and, and low risk are, are part of that. But they have a different partnership. Uh, and sometimes they come together, yeah, because uh, I spent quite some, our CF CFO is a very senior CFO, so you, 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 he also has views on people. And, and, and we listen very carefully to him because he knows the company really well. Uh, so some, some have a different role again. Uh, but, but intrinsically, I think HR is different. We play a, diff a different relationship with the, with the CEO, I believe. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for coming to campus and uh, for all you do for, our, for all of our, our graduates. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. You just listened to another CHRO conversation. Today, Ronald Shellikins of PepsiCo shared his views regarding the role of HR in driving business success. He also shared ideas for how HR can lead efforts to advance culture, as well as diversity, inclusion, and engagement and how each can help advance company success while helping to improve customer experiences. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program and the Center for Executive Succession here at the University of South Carolina, thank you for joining us.